Football is a team sport, but the World Cup final in Qatar two months ago, between France and Argentina, was very much billed as the battle of two players. On one side, there was Lionel Messi, already the greatest player of all time in a lot of people's eyes, competing in his last World Cup. Having already won everything in the club game, including the Champions League and the Ballon d'Or by the age of 22, the World Cup was the one trophy, but the biggest trophy of them all, that had eluded Messi. Age 35, he had 90 minutes to change that and cement his status, in most people's minds, as the greatest to have ever played the game. On the other side, there was Kylian Mbappe. Age 23, Mbappe was already competing in his second World Cup final, having won the first one in Russia four and a half years ago. A generational talent, the star of the tournament up to that point, and the man that most people expect to inherit the mantle of being the best player on the planet, during the post-Messi and Ronaldo era, Mbappe had the chance to win his second World Cup before turning 24, following in the footsteps of the late great Pelé. Neither player would disappoint. Messi scored the opening goal and played a key role in the second, as Argentina dominated the opening 75 minutes, but then came the Mbappe-inspired France onslaught. In just two minutes, Mbappe scored two goals, one from the penalty spot, just like Messi, and the other an outrageous volley, which left the world speechless. Deep into extra time, Messi scored again. It looked to have been written in the stars, the world's greatest player scoring at the death in his last chance to crown his country as world champions. Mbappe, it would seem, hadn't read the script. Just two minutes from time, he dispatched his second penalty of the match to complete only the second hat-trick in a World Cup final and to take the game to penalties. Argentina won the match, both Messi and Mbappe converting the opening penalties in the shootout, but both players emerged with their already sky-high reputations even further enhanced. Be in no doubt, this was the greatest player of all time and the greatest of the subsequent generation. The idea that they should play for the same team at club level, therefore, as even some Americans with only a very fleeting interest in the sports observed, seemed to be downright unfair. Throw in the best player for the pre-tournament favourites Brazil, the star of a Morocco team that reached the semi-finals, a goalkeeper capped 50 times by the reigning European champions at the age of 23, and the most decorated centre-back ever to have played the game, surely the team that has all of these players must be some kind of all-conquering juggernaut that has made European football their own. Well, not quite. Despite having the backing of the same Petro state that hosted the 2022 World Cup, since 2011, PSG are yet to win the Champions League. Knocked out in the round of 16 last season, the Parisians just lost in the first leg at the same stage against Bayern Munich this season, fresh off the back of a defeat to Marseille in the round of 16 of the Coupe de France. PSG have now lost three games in a row for the first time since the Qataris arrived in 2011. They have already lost more games in 2023, in February, than they did in the whole of 2022, and real questions are starting to be asked of how it has come to this for a team which has the odds so firmly stacked in their favour. So, 15 months on from my last video about PSG, entitled Have PSG Created a Monster They Can't Control, which has aged considerably better than most of the drivel that comes out of my mouth on this channel, I wanted to return to the French capital, and specifically to the Parc des Princes, to ask the question of whether PSG are the stupidest club in all of world football, how they could have done things differently, and why if only they had hired me as their director of football, they'd probably be bigger than Real Madrid by now. All of which seems particularly relevant at this moment in time, as the Qatari state is in talks to take over at Manchester United as well. When Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, the Emir of Qatar, acquired PSG through the investment vehicle Qatar Sports Investments in June of 2011, and then became the club's sole owner in March 2012, he and the dictatorship that he rules over inadvertently struck gold. PSG have occupied a pretty much unique position over the last decade, as the sole superclub in a region which has become the greatest talent factory in all of world football. 
The Ile de France region, which surrounds and includes France's capital, has given rise to an extraordinary number of footballers during that time frame. Key members of France's 2018 World Cup winning squad, such as Kylian Mbappe, Paul Pogba and N'Golo Kante, were all born in Paris's relatively impoverished suburbs, or banlieues, as they are commonly known in France, which have large first, second and third generation immigrant populations. Mbappe's father is from Cameroon, whilst his mother is of Algerian Kabyle descent, Pogba's parents are both from Guinea, and Kante's parents hail from Mali. All four of those countries, you may have noticed, are former French colonies. Other examples include Jules Koundé, Riyad Mahrez, Christopher Nkuku, Ferland Mendy, Ibrahim Akanate, William Saliba, Adrian Rabiot, and Seiko Fafana. In recent years, Paris's banlieues haven't just been more productive than other regions and cities renowned for producing great players, such as London, Sao Paulo, and Madrid. They have outperformed almost every entire country on the planet. What's more, whilst London is home to six Premier League clubs, including Tottenham Hotspur and Arsenal, Corinthians, Palmeiras, and Sao Paulo are all fighting to secure the best players from the city of Sao Paulo, and you can throw Santos into the mix from the state as a whole. And Madrid has three La Liga teams, including two European giants in Real and Atletico Madrid. There isn't a single top-flight football club from the entire Ile de France region, which is home to over 12 million people, let alone from the city of Paris, other than PSG. In other words, PSG ought to have an effective monopoly over the greatest talent factory on planet Earth, yet they have failed miserably to capitalise upon that gift from the heavens. Of all of the players that I just mentioned, who were born within a stone's throw of the Parc des Princes, only Kylian Mbappe plays for PSG, and they paid £163 million for him, the second highest transfer fee of all time, he didn't come through their own youth ranks and the only ones who did actually come through and then graduate from their youth ranks, namely Adrian Rabiot and Christopher Nkuku, were sold for nothing in Rabiot's case, and just 13 million euros in Nkuku's. This is what I like to call the Komen Conundrum. Yes, I just invented it now, no doubt everyone will be talking about it soon. I will also accept the Komen contradiction as a viable alternative, but I really do think that the Komen conundrum is a better fit on the balance of things. Kingsley Komen was born not actually in one of Paris's many banlieues, but in the city itself, to parents from Guadalupe. Komen joined the youth ranks of Senar Moisse at the age of six, who compete in the regional and wholly amateur sixth tier of French football. Following two years there, the youngster was spotted and signed by PSG. A star man for France from the under-16s all the way through to the under-21s, and among the most highly regarded youngsters in Europe in his teenage years, Komen became PSG's youngest ever player at the age of only 16. By 17, however, he had decided that his future lay away from the club, having made just four first-team appearances. In his own words, Komen said that he felt Juventus suited him more, that he would make more first-team appearances there, and that he had doubts about the capabilities of some of the senior figures at PSG. PSG didn't receive a penny when Komen departed, as he signed for Juventus on a free transfer after his contract had expired, and a year later he joined Bayern Munich on loan and then on a permanent, in a deal which pocketed Juve a combined 28 million euros. Since leaving PSG, Komen has won the league in every single season of his career, taking him up to a tally of eight top flight league titles at the age of 26. He has reached two Champions League finals with two different clubs, and he won the second one in 2020. The Champions League final that Komen won with Bayern Munich in 2020 came against PSG, and it was fitting that he should score the only goal of the match in what was a close encounter to deny his boyhood club of their holy grail. Komen, once again, scored the only goal of the game as Bayern beat PSG on Tuesday night to take a 1-0 lead with them to the second leg back home in Munich. Komen is almost too perfect of an illustration of what the Qataris have got wrong at PSG. By buying a club in League 1, which is the weakest of Europe's big five leagues, and pumping it with as much, if not more cash than any of the continent's super clubs, 
PSG were always going to become flat track bullies at home. PSG's budget is literally five times that of the next highest spending league on side, which means that winning the league on title or the Coupe de France is barely considered an achievement. It's more of a foregone conclusion. The Champions League was always likely to become the de facto mark of success at PSG then, but PSG actually made it the official one. Club president Nasser al Khalafi stated publicly, as early as 2014, that the Champions League was PSG's be-all and end-all, and that failure to win it in the next four years would constitute failure. That was nine years ago now, and by measuring themselves solely by their fate in a knockout competition every season, he put PSG on a harding to nothing. It's quite difficult to win the Champions League. I'm not sure if Al Khalifi, a former tennis player who achieved a career high of 995 in the world rankings, was aware of that at the time. And even if PSG were a well-run football club, which they most assuredly are not, that would still be the case. And at this point, 12 years into the project, even if PSG did win the Champions League, there would be no lack of football fans who would shrug their shoulders, point to their spending and say, only one in 12, 15 or 20 years, depending on when, if ever, that moment finally arrives. As much as the failures of strategy and general mismanagement, that is what PSG have got so badly wrong. No one likes them including their own ultras and supporters quite a lot of the time, who have voiced their displeasure at how the club is being run, and when you're in the business of sports washing, that is somewhat problematic. After all, we can't lose sight of what PSG and a handful of other football clubs have become. This is not a fan-owned community club, which is what PSG was founded as, owned by 20,000 members, nor is it the preserve of a handful of wealthy Parisians who wanted to see their team succeed, which is what succeeded the club's fan-owned days. This isn't even a club owned by an investment firm, as PSG were in the form of Colony Capital, up to 2011, seeking a return on their investment based upon sporting and commercial performance. No, this is a club owned by a state, they would deny that, but they would be lying, which has zero emotional attachment to the club, and is totally dispassionate to its fate, other than as a means for achieving its wider goals. Sometimes those goals align with the views and ambitions of the team supporters, as has been the case up to this point, broadly speaking, at Manchester City or Newcastle United, but there are times, inevitably, when those two things don't align. That's not to say that the Qatari state doesn't want PSG to win the Champions League, for example. Of course they do, just that they want it for very different reasons to PSG fans, and it is not their primary goal. What PSG is in the business of doing is giving the state of Qatar ever closer ties to the French government, French politicians, and French business people, increasing Qatar's influence and soft power within the region, and cleansing the image of what is in fact a tiny authoritarian dictatorship in the Gulf. That is why, throughout their ownership, the Qataris have always been more focused on signing superstars than they have been on building a great team. You look at the likes of Beckham, Buffon, Dani Alves, Neymar, Messi and Sergio Ramos, undoubtedly all great players, but that isn't the main reason why any of them were signed. Beckham was only at PSG for six months, but he played his last ever game for the club, creating iconic images of him crying in a PSG shirt, which were broadcast around the world. And Qatar went on to further extend that relationship with Beckham by paying him £150 million for a 10-year propaganda campaign. Buffon stuck around for just a single season, perhaps they were hoping he'd retire there too, but the Italian is still somehow going strong at 45, now back at Parma. Alves, similarly, was only ever a short-term arrival, Meanwhile, Neymar was signed as a statement of intent to send out a message to the rest of world football that PSG could effectively sign whomever they wanted by meeting a release clause that Barcelona had set in the belief that no one would ever be stupid enough to pay such a ridiculous transfer fee. I suspect that the upsides of signing Messi, as they saw it, go without saying. 
It is perhaps telling that it was in 2011, shortly after Qatar won the right to host the 2022 World Cup, that Qatar decided to take over PSG. In November 2010, the Emir of Qatar, then French President Nicolas Sarkozy, and then UEFA President and France footballing legend Michel Platini, all had lunch together at the Elysee Palace. Shortly after that, Platini switched his vote for the 2022 World Cup hosts from the United States to Qatar. Qatar subsequently not only bought PSG, but also increased its ownership in a French media group, acquired the broadcasting rights for all of French football, and made a series of commercial deals with the French government, which have continued ever since. Sarkozy can still often be spotted sat alongside PSG president Nasser El Khalifi at PSG Games, and the current Emir of Qatar attended PSG's defeat to Bayern Munich on Tuesday night, but only because he was already in the French capital, to hold talks with now French President Emmanuel Macron to discuss a further strengthening of the country's relations and future deals regarding the exports of natural gas. It would be fair to say then, that football wasn't the single most important part of the Emir's trip. Platini claims that his meeting with Sarkozy and the Emir had nothing to do with him switching his vote, and that he wasn't told to do so by Sarkozy, stating, quote, Sarkozy never asked me to vote for Qatar, but I knew what would be good, end quote. Good for who exactly, he didn't state, though, one can guess, nor was it ever clarified, at least as far as I can tell, as to why Platini just so happened to be having a spot of lunch at the Elysee Palace with the French and Qatari heads of state. Qatar, of course, denies any wrongdoing. They do that a lot. Now that the World Cup is over, there are those who wondered what kind of appetite Qatar would have to continue investing in PSG and whether they might alter their strategy moving forward. In terms of image, it's always going to be difficult to be cool, and I use that word with a bit of a cringe, or just to be liked when you dominate domestically every season by virtue of having a much larger budget than any of your rivals. The cool teams tend to be those who play good football, don't always win, and have an inferior budget to their rivals, whether that be Borussia Dortmund, Napoli, or Atalanta, but some still do it better than others. Barcelona, Ajax, and to a lesser extent Benfica, for example, all either are or were fairly well-liked, even whilst being relentlessly successful, certainly domestically at least, and having among the largest, if not the largest, wage bill in their respective divisions. What those three all have in common, a clear and very well-defined identities, tied to the major European cities in which they are based, and a fantastic track record, of developing youngsters and locals and providing them with a pathway to the first team. PSG, as we have already established, practically hold a monopoly as a football club over arguably the most iconic city in Europe, if not in the entire world. Paris is famous for being the city of love, it has incredible history, more iconic landmarks than just about any other place on earth, a very distinct culture and identity, and, to top it all off, an ability to churn out a plethora of outstanding footballers. In essence, the Qataris had everything that they could ever have dreamt of handed to them on a plate at PSG, but they chose to send it back and order a plate full of foie gras, white truffle, caviar, A5 Wagyu, and those Yubari melons that you get in Japan that can cost about 50,000 quid. All very expensive foods, highly coveted and considered to be delicacies, but together they clash. There is just far too much going on, making for a wretched dish and leaving you feeling rather nauseous by the end. Alright, I am labouring the metaphor just a little, but you get the general idea. PSG were once cool. They had JJ Acocha and Ronaldinho in the same team for Christ's sake, along with a local wonder kid in Nicolas Anelka. Sure, they didn't win anything, but they won the Champions League just as many times as the current crop. With a big budget, let alone an enormous one, it would have been possible to build the best academy in world football to nurture the finest crop of young players anywhere on the planet, 
build a team of world-class locals from your own youth ranks with close ties to the club, and complement them with just a sprinkling of Galactico-style signings. For a bit of fun, I had a go at doing just that. Here is a solely Ilda France 11, and here is what the final product might look like, with just three signings, not from within the club's immediate vicinity. Not bad, eh? I have just saved PSG about a billion euros, halved their wage bill, made them slightly cool and liked again, and a much better team. If anyone from PSG is watching, I do offer consulting services, but I do not come cheap. This is a point that I saw reiterated by Grace Robertson on Twitter the other night, the same night that PSG lost to Bayern, about the lack of identity in local players, and it's one that seems so obvious. What is particularly unusual is that PSG have actually incorporated the incredibly powerful brand of the city of Paris when it comes to their kits, various fashion wear, and other forms of branding. They've just totally overlooked it on the pitch. I suppose it's possible that that is being driven by Nike rather than PSG themselves, but it is hard to believe that no one at the club can have spotted this contradiction. I mean, how many winning goals does Kingsley Coman really have to score against them before the penny finally drops? You'd really have thought that two, one of them, coming in a Champions League final would have been enough. From the perspective of a Manchester United fan, even if you are to ignore all of the ethical considerations, purely from a footballing perspective, are these really the people that you would want owning your club? A Petro state that struck gold in 2011, but has spent the last 12 years importing very expensive silver instead. The difference at Manchester United being that they don't have a monopoly, and there are no guaranteed titles in the Premier League. Now, it would be remiss of me not to point out that there is some evidence that PSG have changed tact over the last 12 months. Leonardo, PSG's former sporting director, who was criticised by fans, was sacked in May 2022. Luis Campos, officially appointed as a football advisor, is his de facto replacement. For the uninitiated, Campos is widely regarded as one of the finest talent spotters in world football, and he was responsible for the recruitment, which led to both Monaco and then Lille winning the league on title ahead of PSG, through signings like James Rodriguez, Bernardo Silva, Nicola Pepe, Rafael Liao, and Victor Osimhen. Now he is operating with a much larger budget. The appointment of Christophe Gaultier, who won the league on title at Lille, can be viewed in a similar context. As someone who is renowned for giving young players a chance, and for having a clear idea of how he wants his teams to play. Up until now, could anyone really pinpoint a style or philosophy that was distinct or unique to PSG? Whether that be under Ancelotti, Tuchel, or Pochettino. A persistent problem at PSG, according to several sources at this stage, has been the meddling of club president Nasser al khalifi and key to any future success at the very highest level will be football decisions being left to football people. Who gets to make those decisions, however, is another contentious issue which only adds to the internal drama and politics which has plagued the club from boardroom to dressing room level. Antero Herrero and Luis Campos, for example, were said to have been at loggerheads during the summer transfer window, and PSG ended up missing out on all four of their primary targets in the forms of Milan Skriniar, Robert Lewandowski, Bernardo Silva, and Marcus Rashford. In January, the club missed out on another main target, this time Hakim Ziyech, though for rather different reasons in that case. There is also evidence that PSG are finally starting to look to their academy and the wealth of talent right on their doorstep. Warren Zaire Emery, at the age of 16, has already made 15 first-team appearances this season and became the youngest player in the history of the Champions League knockout stage when he started against Bayern Munich. Meanwhile, 17-year-old El Shadil Bitshaibu has already registered 10 senior appearances. They were born in 2005 and 2006, and should form the club's spine for the next decade and beyond. It also cannot be overlooked, just in the interest of balance, that PSG came very close to winning the Champions League in 2020, 
losing a 50-50 game in the final against a Bayern Munich team that had absolutely steamrolled their way through to the final, smashing the likes of Barcelona, Chelsea and Lyon. That doesn't change the fact that they didn't win that game though. They don't have a clear sense of identity or style, despite one being so readily available. They have failed to capitalise on the wellspring of local talent that they have been blessed with, and the club is a toxic mess at this moment in time. Currently experiencing their worst run of form in more than a decade, PSG are already out of the domestic cup competition, a bitter blow, especially coming at the hands of their fierce rivals Marseille. They face an uphill battle to get beyond the round of 16 in the Champions League for a second successive season, heading to Munich with a one-goal deficit, and their next two league games are against high-flying Lille and Marseille. They should win both, but in their current form, who knows? PSG are only five points ahead of Marseille in the league on table, which means the next few games really could be make or break. Not since their first season under Qatari ownership, in the 2011-12 campaign, have PSG had a trophyless season. Repeating that feat, with a front three of Messi, Neymar and Mbappe, a budget which is at least five times that of every other team in France, and the highest wage bill in all of world football, whilst improbable, admittedly at this stage, would be almost impressive in a weird sort of way, and a damning indictment of the appalling way in which the club has been run. That is it for today's video. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. Let me know if that was the case, and hit the like button if it was. That is probably the best way to let me know. Apparently, it's really helpful in some magical algorithm that I, I, I can't conceive, let alone understand. Uh, so yeah, hit the like button, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure you are subscribed to HITC7s and have notifications turned on, and also for my backup channel, it should be on screen now. And you can also find me on social media on either Twitter or Instagram, just via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.